right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to, to finally meet you because this is how we meet each other nowadays over Zoom. So why don't you tell right. us a little bit about yourself and your organization and what you're passionate about? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Paul Gemberg. I'm a partner at BCGX, which is the design tech and business builder arm of the Boston Consulting Group. Nice. Um, and essentially what we do is we work with large corporates to help them build new products, new services, new businesses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. And we've been in business for the most part since 2014, I believe. Oh, wow. So are yeah. you, were you always a part of BCG or did you, were you an independent company and then? Um, no, they, the, the founding team was brought in by BCG, right. And mm -hmm. BCG has been around since, uh, for 60 years plus, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Forever. Uh, forever. <laughs> um, and so the, the founding team was brought in in 2014. I joined uh, about a year later in 2015. Mm -hmm. I had a stint uh, for five years. And then I left for one of the founding, the companies that we founded, that we built with Shell called Studio X. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the CEO and had a product for that company and um, uh, grew that to a certain size and then uh, decided to come back. I, I didn't get, I didn't have enough consulting in, uh, I hadn't done enough consulting in my opinion. Um, and so I came <laughs> back in March. So I've been back just about a year. Wow, yeah. that's funny. You haven't done enough consulting. I know, <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you were on Fishbowl at all, but there's all like there's a whole like consulting exit opportunities fishbowl where people are like get me out of here it's so much work <laughs> yeah there's there's i mean there's the funny ones i mean fishbowl is an interesting take i mean it, you know consulting i think in every flavor right whether it's man traditional management consulting or more of the agency work has definitely has its perks mm -hmm. but it also has its challenges um yeah. i think for me what what really draws me to consulting is the ability to work on different problems at different time and not being stuck. I think uh, one thing I learned from, from um, working on Studio X is uh, I really, I mean, obviously enjoy uh, building a product and, and, and seeing it through, but what I really like is the zero to one, right? Really mm -hmm. building something from scratch, getting yep. it launched and then, you know, handing it over to, to a founding team or to a, a broader team or an internal business unit to, to keep it growing. I think, um, you know, and oh, so yeah, that's, that's the why stuff. I started Yep, that's the right. stuff I love too. Is that is that really where it happens though in the consulting teams as in that, as opposed to within organizations? Is that usually what happens? Yeah. So so um, the way our model differs a little bit from sort of more traditional consulting engagement is that we um, we work hand in hand with uh, with a team. So we have an embedded team from the client with us. Mm -hmm. And um, and it goes all the way from research, uh, human centered research, all the way through to actually building the product, the service, whatever it is that we are we're building, um, and they're part and parcel of that process. Now, sometimes um, that that uh, that ends up being a new company, and that gets spun out into mm -hmm. a um, into a new entity. Maybe people from BCG and BCGX might join that team. People from the corporate partner might join that team. Um, and they're off on their own. Um, but uh, we do a lot of what we do uh, around the core. So meaning that gets reabsorbed by the mothership, so to speak. And um, uh, and then at that point, it, it is super important to have the have the buy in and sort of the involvement of of those teams, because, you know, they're taking in something from the outside and and sometimes the the corporate antibodies want to to, to shut that down. Um, whereas <laughs> so you know, if, true, right? Yeah, right. If, but if you bring them along and, and they're part of the process, you know, you've you've built these ambassadors, these champions of this new product, this new way of doing, uh, this new way of working, and and the the likelihood of success is that much bigger. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious to know where the idea starts. Like, does it start in your client? So your client has an idea and says here's a problem we need to solve. And then they bring you guys in, you go, oh, this is what you need to build and the, let's build it together. Or how, do, how does that, where does the initial concept start? Yeah, it's a bit of a spectrum. It goes all the way from, hey, blue sky innovation. We know we need to change in a particular area or we want to explore a completely new adjacent industry, let's say. And then at that point, you know, we go through a much more exhaustive or, or sort of divergent process to find out what are the true opportunities, what are the frictions in that new space that really warrant something to be created and built. 
Um, but then there's a lot of times where the client comes to us with, hey, I have this idea. I've, we've been tinkering. We have a proof of concept, you know, some, sort of a, a, a different level of maturity, but they come with something. And then at that point, we evaluate the, the, the idea, the what's been built already potentially. And we say, okay, here is what we need to do to get it to the next level. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's literally just an idea in a slide. Um, at that point, it's more extensive. Sometimes um, it, they've they've built a piece of technology. They have an IP that they already are trying to commercialize. They they, they just need a bit of a a push to accelerate. Maybe it's about mm -hmm. building a broader uh, ecosystem around partnerships or or commercial opportunities. You know, versus you know the technology. You don't they don't really need to be. It doesn't need to be built because it's already there. Mm -hmm. No, that sounds like a really cool gig. I mean, this is this is innovation. Right. I mean, you're building new products all the time uh, for for customers and and you're actually taking part in rolling them out as well and, and all that good stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, it truly is from zero to one. So, um, you know, and that's what I love. Right. It's you know, I, you know, I don't want to be just building slides. And trust mm -hmm. me, there's a lot of slides being built. Um, <laughs> that's the other uh, side of the organization. Right. You guys build the actual stuff. The rest of right, that's right. does this does the slide wear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a lot of slideware, but um, you know that's what I love is is to think about the technology and what needs to be built. Um, and 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 it's not just me. So I'm just one sliver of a broader you know, multidisciplinary team. So I'm a strategic designer, designer by trade. Um, we'll bring in experienced designers, engineers of all flavors, um, strategists, uh, you know, what have you. Whatever we need to bring from a, an expertise, we bring in. But mm -hmm. fundamentally, it's it's cross uh, multidisciplinary. Like that is one of the core principles. Um, you know, we don't believe in sort of handoff. So, oh, let's just do research, and then we hand off to oh, let's just design, and then oh, no, now build. No, it's sort of a continuum. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's there's times where you prioritize more of the research, you prioritize more of the exploration, and then it shifts towards building but even then you're starting to iterate right and you're you're tweaking along the way and you say okay we tried this this is not quite working so we need to we need to switch tax and that's through continuous probing with customers with end users to make sure that what we build is what really is going to be desired and what people are going to be willing to pay for because ultimately right. so, you know this is not altruistic although you know we try to to be net positive when it comes to society Mm -hmm. you know, you, we're building businesses we're building you know growth and and to do that you, there sort of needs to be an exchange of value of some kind right so are you building mostly b2b or b2c or or everybody everything um yeah i'm mostly around um what we call industrial goods and that is mm -hmm. b2b primarily mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but at x we at bcgx we we have all sectors right there's some people that are much more on the consumer side so they're they're going much more b2c um but but personally, um, I've been more focused on the on the B two B space because, to me, a um, couple reasons. One, they're probably less sophisticated in terms of their their innovation journey. So there's mm -hmm. more opportunities. There's there's some bigger system. I like the way you said that. Problem. By the way, yeah, right. <laughs> it, it politically astute. Very well. Uh, very well said. <laughs> Um, yeah. So so to me, the, the 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 complexity of the problems to try to solve in the B two B space are um, much more interesting uh, and more intellectually challenging. Mm -hmm. um, what's been really interesting that we've seen lately is sort of the convergence of the space. So working with an industrial company that's trying to commercialize a product for end users. So going more direct to consumer mm -hmm. and, and seeing how those two worlds kind of you know merge, is it's been really an interesting challenge to see the speed at which you need to move to meet consumer demand, but right. that's in direct conflict with their level of comfort in terms of a traditional, you know, hardware manufacturer, for example, or something like that. Yeah. Well, so that's a good question. I mean, how do you bring these super innovative ideas into these organizations? Because I'm assuming in a lot of them, there's a lot of pushback, right? There's like, okay, you know, this is not how we do things. Um, how do we how do we change this thing? How, how do you bring these new ideas into these companies that might be a little more, a little more, like you say, <laughs> a little more? Uh, let's see, a little. They have a more of a runway to innovation. Yeah, I guess that's you right. Could say. 
<laughs> well, I think it used to be where where companies, I think, had skunk works, right? This, oh, let's do this all, you know, hidden um, and let's do a big reveal at, at some point, right? And I think what works better is when you bring people along because then the hurdle is 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 a lot less challenging. Um, but there's a couple of considerations. One, you have to, a bit, to have a bit of foresight in terms of understanding where is this new product, new service is going to live. If it's going to sit outside the the core of the company, at that point you can you can you can isolate it a little bit more. And actually, you may want to isolate it a little more a little bit more so that um, it has room to breathe. But if it's going to hit some core services within a company, at that point, you really have to bring them along and you really have to involve them along the way. So a couple of ways to do that. One, like I said, embed team members into your uh, into your team and make them equal uh, contributors to the, the the learnings, to the, the, the creation of content, to the building, right? Yeah. The other part of that uh, is engage with um executives at varying levels but ideally starting from the top to to make sure that you get the buy-in you get um that they message to the organization that this is a strategic priority mm -hmm. that um the proper resources are marshaled in order to to um, not guarantee success but to increase the likelihood of success yeah um yeah so that's one thing the other thing i would say sort of culturally is one thing that we fight is um, sort of what I like to call corporate inertia, mm -hmm. and 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 the, and and that really has to do with um, accepting levels of risk, right? Mm -hmm. And if you know BCG and BCGX primarily has really brought in this notion of combining three core philosophies. One is design thinking, broadly mm -hmm. speaking, like build with the human at the center. Yeah. Two, it's agile, right? Agile. And, and, you know, two weeks sprints, agile methodology, all of that, right? So so you're building progressively uh, versus, you know, setting a spec and then waiting two years and having it build and then testing, right? Which right. I, Does anybody do that anymore? I don't know anybody who does waterfall anymore, uh, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, waterfall happens maybe a bit more in, in different contexts. Like if you're building a piece of hardware, then there's mm. naturally a bit more of a waterfall element to it because you're building tooling and, and things like yeah. that that require that. But yeah, I think, um, you know, hopefully it goes to the wayside a bit more. Well, in <laughs> software development, yeah, I guess when you're building a building, it's different. You can't have yeah. an agile building. <laughs> exactly. And then the third one is lean startup, right? This yeah. notion of build the sort of vertical slice, um, uh, you know, MVP and and test it and, and iterate. And if you bring that and that that's still, even though it's been around for all three of them for quite a long time, it's, mm -hmm. you know, the combination is, is still quite novel for, for a lot of companies. And I think exposing that to the executives so that they understand that you're building with risk tolerance in mind, I think helps them get over the hurdle that, oh my God, we're, you know, we're going to have to go through this major transition or transformation. No, that's not the case. This is progressive and, and you will get to influence almost on a bi-weekly basis where, mm -hmm. where this product is headed um, based on market conditions, based on what's going on in the company um based on what what is being learned in the field right so that's that's probably easier for uh an outside organization like you guys to do than it would be for say an internal corporate innovator to try and try and do within within an organization so because they're they're bringing you in because they want you to innovate right yes there's definitely an element where we can be i mean what's the famous saying nobody's been fired for hiring BCG, right? <laughs> uh, or I thought it was IBM, know, but BCG works too. <laughs> well, I think it might have been originally IBM and then it's probably co-opted by management consultants, you know, so whether it's McKinsey, you know, Bain or whatever. Um, yeah. But I think uh, to your point, it's, uh, yeah, we're we're sometimes there to, to, to bring external expertise, but um, I've certainly seen as part of our engagement where, we help them build um, a product, a service, what have you, but then we help them build a, a capability. And mm. sometimes that's sort of informal through this embedded model, right? And then they go and take that on. Or sometimes it's through a more formal engagement of like, let us help you stand up an organization that will build or will have the ability to build new products, new services mm -hmm. um, internally. Um, Interesting. So that is... 
definitely I'm seeing a whole lot more of that. Whether they do do that as part of an engagement with BCGX or if if they're just doing it in, um, themselves, building sort of a um, and and it's a little different than sort of oh let's do an innovate you know an innovation function right yeah there's similarities, but I think the the difference with the is is that you actually have the build capabilities mm. that's the difference because. A lot of people are, are, are do really well at coming up with ideas. I mean, you know, we have organization that that spend billions of dollars in R and D and have yeah. some of the best IP. Well, where does that IP go? Well, on the proverbial shelf because they don't know how to one build. But then the second part of that is commercialize, and yeah. and that's a, actually and some you know sometimes they have the innovate so ideate and build, but then they don't have the muscle to understand of how to go to market. In a yep. B2B settings, they don't they don't know how to they don't have the the model around going to direct sales model um, or the reps or so and and what it takes to build that organization. So I think yeah, that's that's where we you know knowing how to build zero to one. So from the idea to a commercially viable product or service, um, you know I think that's where where we differentiate ourselves in some ways. Yeah, and if you think about it, it really is uh, an external function, right? Because a lot of these companies. When they first started, they used that process to build their original thing, core thing. Yeah. And now it's a core thing, but they, they they don't think, oh, we need to build another agency. I think I think somebody I knew I interviewed once said, well, every company should be split into two parts. You should be the new product organization, which keeps generating new <laughs> products, and the core piece, which funds the new product generation. But it's like a lot of companies, they don't need that all the time. They go, they just need it whenever. They're thinking, okay, you know, we're seeing a dip in sales in this thing, or we're seeing that there needs to be some changes. So let's bring in an organization to do the new product stuff. And then you can go away afterwards because we don't need to be you to be churning all the time. And I think that's part of the sort of the innovation life cycle where companies are like, they, they staff up an innovation team, they build a bunch of stuff, they build a bunch of prototypes, and then hard times hit and they go, oh, we got to go back to our core mission. So it actually makes more sense to have an external group do all that work and you guys have the have the process down pat as well right i mean you've gone through a lot of a lot of this stuff so you know the most efficient way of building it yeah and i think you have um that's exactly true i think uh for 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 and that's the the advantage that we bring is is we don't have um you know we don't have the internal baggage necessarily um and and then you see companies across the board that have external entities um brand you know they're branded separately you might not even know that they're uh they're part of the companies but they are yeah. the innovative innovation arm uh in some kinds i think um but i think the difference is in sometimes where where you know and maybe that's my i haven't seen it but i haven't seen any or or they haven't necessarily maybe announced it that way where that new innovation came from but i haven't seen the the, the success um or at least the um the market traction as much uh, coming from internally even if it's adjacent mm -hmm. than you know completely external um right because i think we have an ability to um and the agency to disturb and dis disrupt mm -hmm. right uh you know agitate a bit yeah um the troublemakers. <laughs> the troublemakers, yeah. And, and and you know, guess what? If thing, you know, and then if things go bad, we can we'll get blamed. And that's yeah, fair enough. Exactly. Right? Um but I think there's um, a lot of consultants, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. The there, there, there are, there are. Um hopefully they're you know, hopefully we're part of the good ones, the good batch. <laughs> um but yeah, I think internally you, there's this I, and that's where I think um that's where I when I think about corporate inertia. That's sort of an exemplification of that, where you you don't want to necessarily rock the boat, or you're not incentivized to rock the boat. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, you know, I think that's where where we honestly, in some ways, we haven't pushed even as far as we could in terms of how do we think about economic incentives um, with our corporate partners. Right. Obviously, we do shared incentives, part of an engagement, right? And 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 and. In some instances, we get we get um, you know our fees are tied to the success of whatever we build. That's that's. Mm -hmm. But what I mean is like is how what are the constructs that we put in place for these disruptors, and uh, when we uh, and so that they get the upside of building um, 
building a new product or service, right? It mm -hmm. takes, um, and because that will bring um, the type of talent that is inherently risk tolerant, that is willing to, um, you know, in some instances work not necessarily harder, but differently than their counterpart. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes large corporates lose those, that type of talent, that yeah. entrepreneurial talent to entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. And to startups. And, yeah. and, and um, so I think there's a, there's a way that we haven't necessarily cracked the code on, on how to best incentivize people for them to stay uh, long-term and, 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 and do that, that process in repeat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like what happened with the, this, this recent set of layoffs, right? When you were looking at all these 120,000 plus people being laid off at various tech companies. And then you've got a couple other companies coming in and going, well, the reason why there's there's so many layoffs is because they weren't innovating responsibly, which in other words was they were doing things that were non-core, but with an eye to what's the company going to do next. And it's kind of like that, but that happens everywhere, right? But you, you, I think that that's an essential component of any organization, you need to look down, look into the future and go, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do after this? What's going to happen when we eventually lose market share or how can we pivot to increase our market share? So I think that's, that's a core thing that a lot of companies have, but they, they don't, they don't fund it in the hard times because, you know, they were worried about the bottom line. Yeah. Right. And I think there's, the, I've, and I've seen a few studies where they've said that companies that invest in a downturn have a sort of a multiple uh, higher exit post post recession, right? Where they're yep. in, in a huge uh, advantage because they invested it into that into that down market, whether through yep. talent, whether it's through you know maybe it's around aqua hire I mean, versions of M and A, mm -hmm. um, or in in their own R and D. Um, but fun, funny enough, there's sort of still this notion like, oh, we gotta. I mean, we got to be smart, right? You, you cut the fat where you where the fat is is real. Sure, mm -hmm. I think what's hard is 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 to determine where where that is, right? Yep. And um, it's not always obvious. And right. with innovation, it's this it's like discretionary spending, right? Like <laughs> nobody's going to hire an interior designer or an architect um, to to redesign their home. Um, in a downturn, right? They're they're worried about their job. They're going to say, okay, well, let's make sure we we pay for gas yeah. before yeah. we you know choose colors, or we'll do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, same goes for 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 a corporate. Um, so so I think the challenge for us that are involved in the innovation community is how to convince people that it is to your benefit to invest in in your own innovation long term. Um, not always evident. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's sort of like a pivot from disruptive to disruptive to incremental because it's kind of like you look at growth instead of here's here's something we could do next or a few years down the road. Well, how can we improve the profitability of this product or that product or, or a process? So you could just sort of tie it, tie it closer to your core product and then you're golden. Right. I mean, that's that would be the way to do it. Yeah, I always thought there's it's something um, in in product management. There's this model called the Kano model. I don't know if, I don't know if you're familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. Which is you're essentially looking at a need to have feature, nice to have, and and delight, right? And I always wondered about like what if you thought about your your corporate innovation in the same thing? There's mm -hmm. your core, which is you need to have this. Then there's performance features, which is going to enhance the core. But then there's the big bets, which is your delight. But if yeah. those, you know risky and and less less certain but if you hit those right that's going to be your next wave of growth right oh yeah exactly and and i think i wonder i mean i think it's it's a model that can be applied anywhere but i, I i've personally been thinking more about that in terms of how to how to talk about innovation and 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 managing sort of your innovation portfolio in a smart way because mm -hmm. you know when you're growing your business and when you're growing your product you're start you, you're kind of always working on your core, then you, you know, that's 70%, 30% yeah. is on performance features. And then that 10% is going to be, but it's always there. And you don't cut that 10% because you know that if one of those hits, it's going to be your differentiator against your competition, against your yeah. competitive product. And so, you know, I've been thinking about that a little bit more, but. Well, this is how do you, how do you decide? And that's the problem with all of this stuff is, it's kind of like, you really need to build the thing and get it out there in lean startup model, right? It yeah. needs to, it needs to 
uh, I don't know, meet the market, right? Once it meets the market, then the market can tell you this sucks or this doesn't suck, right? And getting it to the point where it meets the market, it's easy to do in software, but in hardware and other places, it's kind of like, how do you get to the point where, you know, I can I can show it to somebody and go, here you go. Is this something you'd be interested in? And that there's there's that leap of faith to be able to build that thing to get it to that point where somebody can look at it, right? Yeah, no, I mean, and that, but I think that's where um, there's a bit of a misconception, in my opinion, is that um, both on software, obviously, like you said, software, a lot easier to, to get these reps to do put a POC out there and say, okay, yeah. did, does, is there any traction, right? Yeah. But yeah. there's different ways of testing. You can test that on a, on a value prop ad. Like what if, you know, and you put that on Facebook or, or LinkedIn or whatever, and you put mm -hmm. the, put marginal amount of, of ad spend on that and you can get a pre a decent read like enough to tell you okay you, you went from zero percent uh, certainty to oh maybe 50 percent certainty right uh, and that that's the stage gate you start with that and, and it took you uh, you know maybe a, a week to come up with a, a, a campaign a campaign of different value prop testing right then you go into okay let's say hardware the heart of mm -hmm. it right okay now it seems like people really want this product well rapid manufacturing right so mm. if it's a plastic part just 3d printed and, yep. and and at this point you can get reasonable volume a couple hundred uh a production run of a you know a dozen to a couple hundred um in a reasonable amount of time put that into uh, uh on an end cap at target mm -hmm. and say okay does that perform right and even right. if it's a test or put that you know test it out in you know on, you know with with users and and get their reaction Similarly, if it's a metal part nowadays, um, you know, 3D printing and we're using different methods, but in metals, totally doable and, yeah. and not like it's not exorbitantly expensive. Right. Mm. So I think um, corporations need to adopt uh, an experiment, uh, experimenting mindset right. in, a w in a much, much bigger way. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's where um there, that's risk averseness. Like they just don't want to do it or, and then it's combined with sort of, I, I it's funny enough, like 3d printing, um, lean startup, you know, innovation methodologies are still sort of the, um, the territory of the few, like it's just yeah. hasn't had the broad, as much as it's written about, it's not in sort of gen pop literature uh, at yeah. the business level. So yeah. there's still not enough, um, familiarity with doing lean tests mm. uh, with people and i think um people that crack that nut around um making those tools to do sort of uh landing page tests super easy and cost effective um you know that's a business to that's a business to build maybe maybe you and i should build it yeah <laughs> but if you think about it the, all of this stuff is in the startup world, right? Yep. Everybody in the startup world is super familiar with this stuff, but all these corporates are like, oh, you know, that's not for us, or oh, I don't know, I mean, that's not gonna work, or we can't do that, but you're right. I mean, we can test. So, I mean, if you think about technology today, we can test out almost anything, just yeah. like quickly, and to see if anybody's interested. And you, you can't just give them, uh, surveys because everybody's going to lie on surveys. You know, it's like, oh, yep. why do you think of this feature? Oh, this feature is great. Yeah, I definitely want it. I'd pay for that. It's like when it comes out, it's like nobody pays for it. But <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Like, I mean, and that's where, um, I mean, that's where the discipline that, of strategic design really, why I loved it uh, so much. It, it combines this notion of, yes, you're, you're doing research with end users, right? In mm -hmm. their, in their home. So, so uh, ethnographic research. But then you combine it with proof of concepts, right? Mm. So, so it might be a, a sketch or, or or a wireframe, right? That you you put in front of users in you know on an iPad, let's say. Yeah. Or it might be you're walking the store with them and you've mocked out an end cap and, with fake products, and then you get you know you just walk by and you say, oh, what do you think about this end cap? Mm -hmm. And then you get their reaction without them necessarily understanding that this is the topic because you've done that with a few others as sort of a way to diffuse their their sense. Oh, this is. We're, we're just getting a sense of the whole story. And suddenly you get the yeah. real reaction um, about, you know, this experience, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's many ways of, of, uh, of enabling real experiences. And, and I think the, the discipline of strategic design is really around how to get to those latent unmet needs that are mm -hmm. really going to drive your business long term, mm -hmm. right? Because you're solving for something that humans didn't inherently know. I mean, right. I kind of like to call those the long cuts, like mm. in so many times I've seen 
humans, whether it's di a digital workflow or a physical workflow, they take 10 steps yeah. instead of two, because those 10 <laughs> steps are like at least perceived easier and might actually be physically easier. But yeah. once you understand what those 10 steps are trying to do, then you build a product around that. And yeah. suddenly you get to that one step or two step approach, but you've inherently understood what they were trying to achieve and you're doing it in a way for them, not for what you think you sh it should be. Yeah. Um, but human beings are so funny. They're like, uh, I, I like this 10 step approach because I can do this and do this, and do this and do this. He like combines a bunch of stuff. So they prefer the 10 step approach to the two step approach. But you, you see exactly. that everywhere, really. I mean, we get used to these things and we, we, you know, we have issues with change. I mean, how do you get human beings to understand that sometimes, a lot of times change is good? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we, if we figure that out, we're billionaires. <laughs> you know, um, I think it's just, you know, human nature. It's, uh, you know, I think it's our fight or flight, you know, yeah. things that are familiar are going to, you know, we're going to always sort of revert to those. And I, I know I find myself like, oh, my God, I, I'm, I'm kind of reverting to what I know instead of trying something new. Mm -hmm. um, it's a constant type with my kids, getting them to try new foods. My God. Yeah. <laughs> like, if, um, you know, and, and I think then you've I mean, that's an experiment in and of itself. Like, how do you how do you. Um, well, you might bribe them, which sometimes I do. Uh, <laughs> but how how do you get people to 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 try new things? Um, it, it's uh, it's difficult. I think there's um, there's one model is the BJ Fogg model around behavior change, which mm -hmm. is around attaching new attaching a new behavior with a past behavior or sort of like a trigger. Yeah. So one way to create new habits, for example, I was um, I wanted to do more push ups, right? Mm -hmm. get, get buff. Always a good, always a good, uh, a good goal. Same yeah, here. exactly. <laughs> right. And so I was reading kind of some of the things and, and one of the things he's, uh, that he says and, and others, right. Um, is around, okay. Attach it to a trigger. So I said, okay, every time I go brush my teeth, I'm going to do, uh, one push up, mm -hmm. Right. And so then I was like, okay, well that's two push ups. So you can brush my teeth morning and the evening. Yeah. And then I'm like, okay. And then I, I just started to add, and then I started to say, okay, um, and the other one I was trying to do, okay, like uh, practice a bit of mindfulness. So like every time you put, and I was, and the, the idea of like being super specific, every time I put my two feet on the floor, as I get out of bed, I'm going to take four breaths. Right. Uh -huh. and, and I, you know, and so that's on a personal level, but I think that model around for existing products and, and getting them to adopt something new or a new mm -hmm. feature is how do you understand again, the behaviors that humans are doing with your product, your service and start to attach something that seems more attractive um, for, for this new for, for this new service or something right. a new feature, right? And I think if we if you can do that and, and, and harness that, then yeah, you can be successful in in changing how your users use your product mm. um, and stuff like that. So it's not a reward, it's just attaching it to something that you already do. So if I brush my teeth at a certain point, then I you just add it to another habit that you already have. It's not, oh, if I do. Uh, if I do 10 push-ups, I can have this reward. It's just attaching it to another pro another habit. Yeah, right? and, and exactly because the the whole point is is you are already you've already created a habit of brushing your teeth of you 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 already get out of bed every yeah. single day for the <laughs> most part. Right. So, so why not? I try. It depends on right. the day. <laughs> exactly right. So so I think th that notion versus rewards is is you know it's it's um you know carrot or stick I think the reverse rewards right. They, 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 um, don't change. They, they, they're good at making change in the short term, but not mm -hmm. sustained, uh, sustained change. Right. So, um, there's another analogy that I've, um, and I forget the book that it's from, but, um, it's this idea of the, the elephant, the conductor and the path. I don't know if you've heard this analogy where, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's all in your head, right? And yeah, part you're, of your... the, you're, the conductor is your subconscious. Uh, mm -hmm. Or sorry, the conductor is your consciousness, and then the elephant just is just gonna barrel down. <laughs> is is the is the, is your subconscious, right? Yeah, very very powerful. And if the conductor can shift where the elephant is going, but they're small, right? It's gonna a lot of effort, and at some point they're gonna dissolve. And that's the 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 effort is um, is the rewards, right? Mm -hmm. And you can get those rewards, but after some time, that that's not gonna be enough. What you need to do is change the path. And that's change the path of the elephant. Change the yeah. path of the elephant, right? Because mm -hmm. the elephant's just going to walk down the path, right? Wherever it goes. 
that's the same thing with uh, with triggers, right? Triggers are, are already ingrained, right? So uh, how do you harness those? And and so an example is if you want to eat more uh, more healthy, and they've done that. I think Google was an example of that, where instead of putting the salad bar at the end of the line where everybody's picked up their their unhealthy food and then they're like, mm -hmm. oh, should I get salad? Uh, maybe not. Yeah. They put it at the front of the line. So people, mm. more people were were getting healthy food, filling up their more of their plate with salad. And therefore, inadvertently, they, they've shaped the behavior. So think about that from a product experience perspective. How are you understanding what those triggers are and where you, you want them to go and see what, what, how do you shift the path to get there versus the human himself uh, or mm -hmm. herself? Very cool. Very cool. I, I have that same thing with I, I have this uh, water flosser and I, I all I did was change the filling time. So I fill it the day before. So I leave it full so I just can grab it and start using it. And if I didn't yeah. leave it full, it, it, there's a little bit of drag there in filling it up. So just the, yes. a small change just like that, yeah. you know, all of a sudden it's like, okay, now I do it all the time every day. So it's, it's great. No, I, I love that, but I, I never seen a salad bar that has the salad at the end. It's always the other way. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I remember reading that they had, they had in their cafeteria and maybe, I don't know if it was Google, but I, I've, I've seen that more and more. Um, and just reminds me that um, we don't necessarily do that. <laughs> we should change that. Anyways, I'll, I'll have to talk to. So yeah, uh, no, the office. and I I love the consulting business because you're right. I mean, it's the same thing. The, the the thing I love about it is that you do get to work on different things all the time. Because if you're working in a corporate environment, it's like okay, I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. Whereas you go from company A to company B to company C, and then you have this great mm -hmm. breadth of knowledge that you're building from all these different engagements. So it's it's really cool. I mean, it, it's it's hard work, but it's really cool, right? I I. I mean, I agree. I mean, that's the, I guess that's why I'm, I'm in it. But the other part that I find really interesting is the ability to cross pollinate. Right. So something I learned, obviously respecting, you know, uh, um, proprietary information, right? So, sure. so uh, we, we certainly don't like you're, we're not supposed to look work for a, 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 a client that is in the same region and the same industry uh, right. for 12 months. So there's sort of all these rules that we, we make sure mm -hmm. that we, we protect our clients, but this notion of, even not even in, in the same industry, but a different industry, you will actually see parallels that, you know, they're non-competing, but the, the problems they're trying to solve are similar and you can yep. learn from each other. And I, I find that just super, just fun to, mm -hmm. to sort of ponder. Um, and you don't get, you don't really get that in the corporate. I worked at Target for, um, God, six, seven years, something like that. And before that, I'd like, I, I worked on the vendor side for, for mm -hmm. a number of years. And and you just didn't get that level of of diversity. Yeah, it was sort of very one track in some ways, and and a lot of fun and super rewarding in in, in different ways. But I I find it from for me to be much more um, rewarding to to do the consulting track and you know and and help companies grow and and, and grow through that. Yeah. Well, no, I find what's interesting is that those solutions. It's just basically the problem is the same, and you solved yeah. it elsewhere in a different way. And then you can just bring that knowledge in and go, this is how you can't say, you know, this is who, why we saw, how we sold it here, but here's how you can apply this type of solution here. So it's almost like the problems are all solved. We just need the communication between them to, to occur yeah. somehow. Right. Yeah. And, and honestly, um, sometimes that's why companies hire management consultants is, yeah. is about that pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. They are seeing within an industry, within a market, certain patterns, um, that when you when you are concentrating on your core business and and growing that core business, you don't have necessarily the the resources to go much broader. Whereas yep. a management consultant firm like BCG can and and are actively doing that because that's their business. That's how yeah. they how, that, how that's how they grow. Um, and, and that's the that's the advantage of it. Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't come cheap. I, I won't I won't I won't say it does, but. Um, I think the level of expertise that BCG has and others uh, is is pretty pretty astounding. I think the, it's interesting. Like I, I, the the recent layoffs you mentioned, like 120 thousand in in, in 2022 for in the mm -hmm. tech space. Yeah, us. Awesome. I mean, we're you know we're super excited because you know we hope to to to, to garner and to capture that talent in house. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have engineering teams, we have designers, we have strategists that um, we have growth marketers. 
Um, it's all the talent that was unfortunately laid off. Um, but you know, ta- you know, great talent that has great exp- experience in in a startup landscape. So they understand yeah. what we're trying to do and yeah. how we're trying to do it. So I think that's um, you know, hopefully. Hopefully we'll capture it. Capture okay. Something. Everybody who's listening, who's looking for yeah, work, right. apply to BCG. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and you know, the, you know, bcg.com slash careers. I think it's, it's <laughs> there's a lot push of it, man. Push it. Yep. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so it's time to think like a futurist. It's the year 2033, 10 years from now. What do you think the world's going to be like in 10 years? Where are we um, going to be? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm totally smitten by gen, gen, generative AI. Oh right? yeah. So, Who so, is it, right? I mean, that's what everybody is talking about nowadays. Everything. I mean, it's just astounding. And I don't know if you've had a chance to play, but I've, you know, obviously, oh yeah, Chat GPT, Mid Journey, uh, Stable Diffusion. So it started out with a, you know, and and all of the tools, and it's just so so. Beginning of last year, it was already a thing, but you know, Mid Journey became a, a big, you know, people were like it kind of became part of the zeitgeist, yeah. right? But it's this it's we're seeing like innovation curve right where like the hockey puck growth where where you now you have chat gpt and then a level of 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 chatter around that and and if you look at the amount of um tools that have been built in the last month alone oh yeah using it's ridiculous GPT or it's gpt3 insane. yeah it's insane yeah and i think that's just that that is just gonna keep keep growing i think there is, you know, this huge worry about jobs being lost. I think, I mean, you've seen it, right? So industrial revolutions, the goods economy, right? Transitioning into a, a services economy. And then now you can, you are, you could argue like it's a knowledge economy. It's about mm-hmm. all of the data that we have, right? About ourselves or about others, et cetera. Yep. Well, I think, you know, that's the, the, but every time there's been jobs created, right? I, my view is that any new technology will create a new set of, of of skills needed to either use it appropriately to 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 work around it et cetera et cetera so yep. yes some jobs will be lost different careers will be will be obsolete but I think you know there the you know the one thing I I think is if you are able to and willing to embrace technology and and how technology can actually shape uh you know industries and and societies, I think you you're set up for for you know real success, right? Embrace and learn about how these AI tools actually work, mm-hmm. the limitations, the ethics behind those. Absolutely. So, ten years from now, I think we will have um, uh, our, even our work, my work, will be um, um, will be dramatically um, changed by these generative AI tools. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, for one, hope that we create an AI that builds slide for us, that I just have to prompt, <laughs> right? Like, I you think just have to know how to write the, it's it's kind of like Google with the search query. You have to know how to write the input yeah. text so it can generate something. Because I've, I've transitioned to, uh, so I have a blog in, that I post uh, uh, every week and I've transitioned to using, using uh, AI tools to do the graphic. Yeah. Yeah, because... I've done uh, same. I don't have a blog, but I've written uh, some some posts and yeah. ab- around leveraging. I think I, I, I I've tried Jasper. I've tried Copy. Uh, I've tried G- Chat GPT. Some of that stuff I... isn't isn't so good. Jasper is not so good, but I like I like uh, recent Chat GPT stuff. But the every it's always yeah. improving, right? Because yeah. they're always adding new stuff, and it's always improving. This the re- the rapidity of the improvement is insane. It's like a month ago it was crap, and today it's like, well, oh, that's not so bad. Next month, who knows where it's going to be, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think the um, one thing that both makes me sort of I'm in awe, but I'm also I'm, I am a little scared. Is Chat GPT three <laughs> has yeah. something like let's say a hundred billion data points that it and Chat GPT four or no sorry GPT three has like a hundred million or something like that. Yeah, G or billion, whatever it is, and then GPT four is going to have like a hundred trillion data points or something. <laughs> yeah, it's so exponentially, like exponentially growing. More. And 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 so then, you know, you you have. I mean, that what well, the way they equated it is that Chat uh, GPT four will have the same amount of neural connections that humans have. Mm. As as part of its system, it's the so, singularity, man. We're yeah, I know, it's I know, coming. it's crazy. So, so I think, <laughs> I think the big thing for 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 ten years from now is people are going to be leveraging these tools to, uh, to do a lot of their work, 
um, transitioning fully into sort of more of a knowledge based economy. Um, I think you're going to have new careers like prompt generators, yeah. you know, understands tools that really well and understanding how to, to formulate really good prompts to, to generate the results that you need. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, but will it, you know, we're, we're all going to have babies food still going to yep. be grown. Yeah. There's, um, there's five or six things that you, all forms. humans do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so a lot is going to change and a lot won't. I think um, what I will, I hope is these types of tools start to um, be leveraged. What, what not GPT because it's a language based model, but um, large scale neural networks used on systemic problems like global mm -hmm. warming. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you know, and they're doing that in terms of in, in, in healthcare, finding new drugs, finding new yep. cures for cancer, et cetera. That to me is where you're going to see transformational change for for society at large. Um, but I mean, I don't think we're there yet. But that yep. hopefully, ten years from now, we'll be able to say that those generative AI is able to dramatically contribute to uh, our success in fighting those types of problems. Yeah. No, I I love that concept because I think that I, that's exactly what's going to happen. Is that there are these really hard problems that we have trouble solving, but it's probably because we can't see enough or we can't see, yeah. like, if you think about GPT four or five or six, like it's beyond what, what, what humans yeah. can put together, who knows what kind of amazing solutions will come out of that. I mean, yeah, exactly. I would, and I have this sense that for some reason, the answers are there. We just need the AI to put all the pieces together because our brains aren't big enough to do it. So it, it would be great. It would, wouldn't it be cool if that's exactly what happened? Like we gave it, you know, solution for climate change, solutions for homelessness, solutions for like, boom, 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 boom. And it would like come back and come up with things that we would never have even thought of. Yeah. So I think that would be, that would be insane if we saw that. And then on the job front, it's kind of like, I always go back to, it's like the early nineties, you know, if someone went back to the early nineties and said, you're going to be a web developer, people yeah. would go, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> So they would have said, no, I mean, Coltran, yeah. I'll do Coltran yeah. or whatever, yeah. whatever. Exactly. The, like, or pie, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. it's that's like fine. you're uh, the the thing is, is that all of these, we, we, are, we always say the same thing. These new technologies will come in and they'll eliminate jobs, but they're also going to create a lot more jobs. So yeah. I remember listening to a futurist who said, you know, auto, automated, automated autonomous vehicles, autonomous electric vehicles are going to eliminate 4 million jobs. And I'm like, yeah they may eliminate 4 million jobs, but they're probably going to create 6 million to 8 million more jobs servicing the the infrastructure, you know, yeah. or doing something completely different. We just don't know what those jobs are yet. And we we can't, because like I said, we, we did like nobody envisioned web designer in the early 90s or in the late 80s. And now, you know, we came and went, web designers came and went. Now we we're completely different sets of things. So, yeah. I mean, you're right. It's like, <laughs> everything changes all the time and we just have to get used to it. Right. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and, and I'm not, I don't want to be, I don't want to dismiss the, the hardships that these, these changes uh, uh, provoke. Absolutely yeah. not. Right. Yeah. And I don't want to be glib about it, but I think that's where, where um, society, that's where governments, that's where uh, private enterprise, it, it is in their best interest to uh, create opportunities for people to either, upskill retrain yeah. um because you know i think there's there's sort of lived knowledge that that those knowledge economy knowledge systems require yeah. to to build and to be ethical right so mm -hmm. if you can imbue that into the creation process you're going to build bring in those biases um as part of it um and 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 sort of if you, and if you have a well-rounded amount like different people different perspectives that's where you get you know you get better systems you get better uh better outcomes ideally yeah yeah and that's why i think so we're going to be working together with ai i mean we're going to be co-creating with ai as opposed to it's just going to take yeah. our jobs because it's going to it's going to come across things that humans will have to provide input for and it'd be great if you know i, I wouldn't mind if i'm just like walking down the street and some ai says hey you know want to make five bucks do this i'm like sure <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll be and, integrated one big system. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's really, really big into generative art, and he's a creative, and and that's that's his business. And he was telling me he was starting to use Midjourney as mm -hmm. a tool. And and one thing to realize is artificial intelligence is trained on a particular set of data, 
And, yeah. and that set of data has its own aesthetic, let's say in, in mm -hmm. sort of in terms of art. And so yeah. he was trying to get it, get it to do something completely different. And, and it just couldn't, it was reverting mm -hmm. back to, you could start to see, and he did it enough that he started to see the patterns where, you know, um, uh, the, the art that was being created was of a particular type. And you could, you could almost see that, oh, this is the library of images it was using. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you start to have a, a broader volume of, of, of data to, for, to, to train on, but that's where humans start to be able, can see those patterns really quickly. Whereas I don't think AI can yet. Yeah. And so I think how, how can we, that's a job like to, to be a, 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 a curated AI curator, right. Where you're yeah. really being able to feed it the right types of information to, so that you know that the output is going to get there, but they're starting to bring in some other stuff in there that you just weren't expecting. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, it's augmented, it's augmented humanity. Yeah. Augmented mm -hmm. humanity. I mean, then the next step is, is implants, but I'm not sure if I'm ready for that. <laughs> I'm ready for my iPhone, you know, like shoved That's in right. my eye. <laughs> I saw awesome. like they just created that just recently. Yeah. It's crazy. It's there. We'll there. We'll be there. Apple glasses will be coming out soon. So I can't wait to see those. Right. I know, those right. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been, this has been great. Thank you so much. Uh, so if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Yeah, I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just search Paul Genberg. That's uh, that's a, an easy one. But mm -hmm. otherwise, just email paul.genberg at bcg.com. Awesome. All right. Thank you, sir. It was great awesome. talking to you. Awesome. Thank you. Nice seeing All you. Right. Talk Bye. to you later. Bye.